from New York to our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power. This is where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start again today with the markets and get an up check, a check on those from Abigail Doolittle. Abigail, what's going on? It's pretty anemic on the surface, David. Very small moves fluctuating between declines and gains for the major averages. Beneath the surface, though, there's lots of action. So let's take a look at what is happening beneath the surface. And from a sector perspective, yesterday we were talking about the financials lagging. That's the case once again today. This could be worrisome because this sector on the year, David, is in a bear market. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not the rally that we've had out of the March lows can continue without this key sector on board. Where we do have lots of green, though, for that biotech sector, once again, the NASDAQ Biotech Index up 1.4%. And one of the big winners there, Novavax, uh, they have received or they're going to be able to receive up to close to $400 million uh, to pursue one of their vaccine treatments. It's fascinating, though, because the stock up 67% at the highs, up 74%. At that point, on pace for its best day since 2009, all on the hope that they maybe will come up with a vaccine. And then the actual timeline toward it uh, could take so much longer. But markets are just so excited for the possibility that a vaccine against this virus virus may be developed soon. Yeah, it's not just the markets. I think all of us are excited if there's, in fact, a vaccine. In the meantime, we've been hearing to Dr. F from Dr. Fauci uh, at today from the NIH talking about exactly the prospects of reopening, what the risks are there. Are the markets reacting to what he's saying up on the Hill? Not all that much, but his remarks are a little bit more cautious, saying it's very unlikely, as we have been talking about, that a vaccine will be available uh, this fall. Uh, the idea of herd immun immunity, uh, not really a lot of positive commentary there. So we have, again, seen the major averages fluctuate slightly, so not a huge reaction, but I would say that there is some caution there. One of the big pieces of news on the day, though, David, that uh, we have been talking about to some degree, and especially yesterday, the issuance, bond issuance. So a piece of this uh, has been on the idea that the Fed is going to step in and buy some of these credit ETFs. Well, lo and behold, today is the day where they start that LQD, the investment grade bond ETF, up more than 20% from the March low, more recently stalling ahead of the Fed actually buying. But today, uh, again, they are actually entering that market. We don't know if it's LQD, HYG, what credit ETFs in particular. We just know that they're entering this market. Uh, so this ETF is up 1%. So we have some Fed support there. And of course, that does seem to be one of the big underpinnings for this risk rally that we have had out of the March lows, David. Yeah, everybody's going to be focused on what the Fed is doing. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, governments, state governments particularly, are starting to open up their economies, but they're not going fast enough for at least some people, including Elon Musk. Elon Musk has reopened his factory in California, even though county authorities told him not to do it, and he essentially dared them to come arrest him in the factory. We welcome now a congressman from California for 18 years, Daryl Issa. He also is a, a small businessman, actually built into quite a big business over the course of his career, and we welcome Congressman Issa now back to Bloomberg. So, Congressman Issa, take the Elon Musk instance specifically. What does that tell us more generally about opening up the economy, at least in California? Well, what it tells you is that he, we really closed the economy based on a statement that if we didn't close major portions, if you will, other than the essential portions of the economy, that we were going to get swamped in our hospitals. Elon Musk is somebody with an IQ that is higher than the rest of the people in the room. He's looking and saying, well, that, that arithmetic never happened. We're at 18 percent capacity in our uh, hospitals, and there's an inherent unfairness that uh, auto manufacturers in states that are allowing them to open uh, are, are basically going to be selling cars. Well, he has none. But also that in California, if let's say you're a defense contractor down here in San Diego, uh, the people that make the Predator aircraft, they by definition never closed because they were essential. But from a healthcare standpoint, there's really no difference between an, an aluminum assembly line for the Tesla and the aluminum assembly line for an aircraft. So, Congressman, I said we all want to get the economy going again. At the same time, we don't want to go so far and so fast as to have some flare-ups again. Is California, in your estimation, ready on the testing front, ready on the excess surge capacity for hospitals, so that if, in fact, there are some hot spots that de develop, you can deal with them? Again, we're sitting at 18 percent of capacity in our uh, hospitals. More than half of our uh, medical workforce has been laid off. Uh, the, the reality is we never even got to half of what New York State got, and we never got to a quarter of what New York City got to. In other words, the premise for shutting down should have been 
or let's say moderating how many people got to work should have been based on health care capacity because that's what we were told it was. We overshot the, uh, the health care capacity savings by five or tenfold. Uh, and you mentioned just before I came on the whole question of, let's say, us versus Sweden. We, if we succeed the way it looks like we're succeeding, are going to have almost no herd immunity. Fall is going to come. We're going to be in a situation where we've essentially infected too many, too few young people, no herd immunity, not yet a vaccine, and potentially be asked to do the same thing again. If you're the man that essentially created PayPal, uh, created uh, a new generation of launch vehicles, and created this, uh, this new car, you think differently, more three-dimensionally than most people, and by the way, more boldly than any other CEO. And that's what's really happened with Elon Musk is he's looked and said, the courts will take years to tell us what rights we have. I only know that this is a wrong. And he's made a pretty bold statement. And this isn't a man who inherently doesn't like the governor uh, or, for that matter, is a partisan. This is somebody who simply did the arithmetic and said, this makes no sense. Uh, Congressman, as I said, you founded your own business long before you went to the Congress. So you know the plight of developing a business, building one, building it up. Give us a sense of how small businessmen in your area of California are doing right now. Has the government done enough to help them? But, you know, if, if the government pays you for two months of being idle, uh, then, in fact, in a sense, they've done what they can do. Uh, the problem is that two months of being idle is coming to an end. Uh, and, uh, and to be candid, I'm going to speak a little ill of the program, the PPP program, for a moment. It didn't differentiate between those who are decimated, let's just say a, a, a sit-down restaurant, uh, or some other small store that's been completely shuttered, it didn't differentiate between that and somebody who's still open. Uh, and that's one of the challenges is we've distorted uh, an economy in a way that as a small time, a small businessman of a few hundred million dollars in sales, I've never seen anything this stupid. We paid the same amount for somebody whose people were going to work every day as somebody who was shuttered by an executive order uh, so you want to talk about a distortion? We have created a distortion in the market that we will be generations writing about and trying to figure out how to unwind. Uh, you know, the, the bottom line is if today you were to go out to the store and let's say you go to a Costco uh, and you, as long as you're there, you want to buy a T-shirt or, for that matter, a surfboard in San Diego or in Riverside or anywhere, you can do that. You can buy that. But just try to find one at thousands of other small businesses that compete for T-shirts and surfboards and, and other items, they're shuttered. So uh, undoing this distortion in a acceptable way, and, and I think it's important that we stop thinking that we're going to prevent the disease and go back to the original concept, which is we're going to protect the elderly and the infirmed, and we're going to make sure that, that we don't swamp the capability of our, our health care providers, which is very different than what Governor Newsom and uh, Governor Cuomo and others are saying. Uh, they're issuing the, well, we have to have no deaths. People will die in San Diego County from the flu in the same month that you're demanding that no one die from COVID-19. Uh, I'm not saying that they're the same. What I'm saying is, is that from a pure business standpoint, our economy needs to generate that $22 trillion that makes us successful. Every month we generate dramatically less, in this case, $10 trillion less effectively. Any month that that occurs is a month in which we're losing $10 trillion that could be applied to all kinds of things, including all those miracle cures that we're still looking for, including this vaccine. Okay, thank you so very much for joining us today. That is Congressman Daryl Issa of California. Coming up here, restaurant chains are trying to get back to work themselves. The question is, how are they going to do that? We're going to talk with a man who is responsible for some 15,000 restaurants around the country, including Popeyes and Burger King. He's Jose Sill. He's the CEO of Restaurant Brands International. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Welcome back to the Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Restaurant Brands International runs almost 15,000 restaurants nationwide, and today it announced plans for reopening a number of those restaurants in a way that will keep both its customers and its workers safe. And we welcome now the CEO of Restaurant Brands International. He is Jose Sill. So, Mr. Sill, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, tell us what will be different as you open up these restaurants than what we saw before. Uh, good afternoon, David. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so, so we've uh, we've obviously been open for business uh, in uh, in North America, in the U.S. and Canada uh, throughout the crisis. So we've had our drive-throughs, our delivery, uh, and our mobile order and pickup, curbside pickup, as well as uh, uh, front counter takeout. We've had it open uh, since the beginning of the crisis, and and our teams have done an exceptional job uh, of taking care of the the team members as well as our guests uh, through enhanced uh, hygiene and other procedures. And and now. As, uh, as different municipalities and states across the country uh, and, and in North America, uh, Canada as well, as they start to reopen uh, the economy and reopen uh, dining rooms uh, across uh, these different municipalities, we've uh, gone a step further. We've taken steps uh, around social distancing and ensuring safe distance measures uh, inside. So tables, uh, in, in many cases, uh, we've had to either rearrange them or close uh, tables down so that we can ensure uh, proper distancing between uh, guests that come in and, and use the dining rooms. We've enhanced uh, PPE, so masks, gloves, acrylic screens in our restaurants, and all of our team members and managers in the restaurants will be wearing the, the gloves and the masks. Uh, and, and we continue to, uh, to, to enhance our, our contactless procedures to ensure we minimize contact in this, in this important moment where we continue to focus on, on flattening the curve and, and getting through this, uh, this difficult uh, pandemic. As you look out, uh, and it's hard for any of us to look out very far at this point, but six months, 12 months, is the business model going to be changed? That is to say, for example, the blend between in-store dining as opposed to delivery and takeout? Yeah, we've seen a tremendous shift uh, into off-premise, obviously, and, and we've been investing in technology uh, in, uh, in our company at, at Restaurant Brands and the three brands that we own, Burger King, Popeyes, and Tim Hortons, we've been investing in, in our technology team with engineers and, and, and digital folks as well for, for quite some time. Uh, and it's been a, a, very, a very important investment as we see today how, how the business has shifted uh, to off-premise. And we, can, we think it'll be that way for, uh, for the foreseeable future. I think we, we think that the business in many cases will, will change forever. But, but in the end, in the restaurant business, um, uh, I, David, I think – there, there, some things will ring true. Uh, they always have and always will. I think people uh, will always want great tasting food or beverages. People will always want convenience and people will, will always want to trust the brands that they, that they visit and solicit. And so uh, we think with all the steps we've taken over the last 10, 12 weeks uh, and, and the great work that our franchisees as well as our team members have done, uh, we think we're really well positioned because of our product, our technology, our safety measures. Uh, all focused on the guest. I think we're really well positioned to win and to win long term, and, uh, and and that's the focus for us in, in this new normal. Uh, Jose, to what extent does your business now depend on things like uh, Uber Eats and Grubhub? By the way, Dow Jones is reporting that maybe uh, Grubhub and uh, Uber Eats are in the Uber are in the process of negotiating perhaps a merger. How does that affect your business? So we, we've been rolling out uh, delivery in, in North America for quite some time, and, and we've accelerated that, that rollout with, uh, especially in, in Canada, uh, with thousands of restaurants uh, onboarding uh, the, the different aggregators that we ha that are available in Canada. In the U.S., we have many restaurants uh, with Burger King and Popeyes and Tim Hortons using uh, multiple aggregators, uh, third-party uh, delivery companies, uh, Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, uh, as well as Postmates. And we also have, uh, we've enabled uh, over the last, uh, since the end of, uh, of, of 2019, we've enabled what we call our white label for um, delivery on our own app, uh, which is increasingly growing uh, as, a, as an important part of, uh, of our delivery business. So we, we, we've been working with many of them and, and all of the, the key providers, and, uh, and we think that having access uh, to delivery through the multiple aggregators and, and as well as our own native apps uh, will give consumers and guests opportunities to enjoy our great products uh, and, and beverages from our great brands uh, any way they want at any time that they want it. Jose, we hear a lot about supply chain right now, particularly when it comes to meat. Should we be worried about whether there's going to be meat available from your stores on, for example, July, July 4? 
No, we, we have a, an amazing uh, group of, uh, of suppliers uh, that we've been working with for, for decades uh, at Burger King, uh, and, so, and, and, and the same for Tim Hortons and Popeyes uh, for, for all the proteins that we, uh, that we serve. Uh, we've got uh, safety measures in place for, for stock and inventory. Uh, we work very closely all the way back to, um, to the raw material suppliers, and, and we're working closely with them uh, during this difficult moment. And, uh, and we feel confident in our supply chain. We feel confident in the quality of our product and in our ability to deliver it uh, every day to our consumers across the country and across North America. Well, say so you have a presence in China. Talk to us about what you've learned from the experience in China. And for that matter, are you thinking about maybe expanding, uh, expanding over there? Luckin is having some difficulty in coffee. Are you going to open a bunch of Tim Hortons coffee shops? Yeah, we've been in, in China for quite some time. We, we have over 1,300 restaurants with Burger King. Uh, we have uh, we, we started to develop Tim Hortons in China uh, in 2019 and uh, and, and had a, a very strong start uh, last year and, and look forward to a, a really fast uh, growth trajectory in uh, in China for the coffee business, which is, we think, one of the, the more exciting markets for coffee uh, around the world, uh, in addition to the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and then Popeye's uh, is uh, is about to open its first restaurant in China uh, in the coming days. Uh, you know, by the end of the week or early next week, it's a beautiful store in uh, in Shanghai. So we we believe uh, long term in in the in that market. We think it's an it's an incredible market uh, where where fast food and, and quick service brands like ours uh, in in space in a space in a segment uh, like burgers, chicken, and coffee that are fast growing in that market will do quite well over time. We learned a lot uh, from our experience with COVID-19 in, in China, the teams uh, at Burger King uh, and Tim Hortons in China uh, that were already operating restaurants did an incredible job, along with our franchisee, to, uh, to you know, to, to, along with our teams as well, to build procedures, contactless procedures, uh, enhance safety, um, you know, temperature checks at the restaurants with infrared thermometers were, were things that we learned uh, here in North America from, from our partners in, uh, in China, and we implemented quickly here. We were one of the first uh, companies and, and brands to do so in North America. Uh, so we, their experience has been tremendous, and their partnership and, and innovation and creativity has helped us um, uh, be able to tra tackle the, 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 the crisis in a proactive and optimistic way, uh, and, and, it, and that's something we bring to the table across all of our brands and all of right. our markets around the world. Right. Jose, I'm going to end with one quick one from a viewer who's been listening to you and has a question for you at your dividend policy. Are you changing your dividend policy given the pandemic? Yeah, we, we just had earnings a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know we, we were happy to report that uh, our balance sheet is strong. We uh, we drew down on our revolver uh, as well as uh, uh, went out for, on, a, on a bond deal, and, and we've got a, a strong uh, and very healthy uh, balance sheet. Uh, that we've uh, that we feel uh, very confident in, uh, but we also are working closely with our franchisees to ensure uh, that they have the, the right liquidity in the near and midterm in the difficult moment. And uh, and we shared uh, as part of our earnings release and uh, and communications that uh, that we the dividend uh, continues at uh, at RBI. Okay, thank you so much, Jose. Really appreciate it. We covered a lot of ground there. That is Jose Sill. He is the CEO of Restaurant Brands International. And now it's time for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. America's top infectious disease expert is warning against reopening the economy too soon. Dr. Anthony Fauci told the Senate panel today that doing so would risk new coronavirus outbreaks. Dr. Fauci also told the Senate Health Committee there are at least eight potential vaccines being developed, and he warned against being cavalier about the risk of the virus and what it poses to children. The UK is extending its furlough program through October. The government's paying the wages of seven and a half million workers to protect their jobs. Some workers will return to their jobs part time. Employers and the government will split salary payments. Spain is seeing its number of coronavirus cases and deaths increase. The country has been slowly easing its lockdown restrictions after more than eight weeks of confinement. 176 people died in Spain in the past 24 hours. That brings the country's total death toll to nearly 27,000. Spain has had more than 229,000 coronavirus infections. A spokesman for Russian President Vladimir Putin has become the latest top official to become infected with the coronavirus. Dmitry Peskov tells Russian media he's been hospitalized and is receiving treatment for the illness. The country's prime minister and transport and culture ministers have also been sickened. Peskov says he last saw President Putin in person more than a month ago. 
Russia has more than 232,000 cases of coronavirus, second only to the United States. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Well, coming up here, we're going to get a chance to talk to the Energy Secretary. He is Dan Burrett about U.S. energy policy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour, and it's Simon Property, which is up nicely today as they came out and said they're going to be relatively aggressive in opening up their centers. And for a report, we turn now to Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? David, it's been an interesting day because at the high, Simon Property Group actually up 9%, and it's counterintuitive only because they missed both top and bottom line estimates. But the selling point, or what had been positive, is what you were talking about, the idea that they are reopening malls. But that's about it. There's not a lot of transparency. Transparency. They did not give detail on uh, rent that was collected uh, both in March and April. They also talked about the idea that they're delaying the dividend. They will not cut it by more than 50%. But again, not a lot of positive information there. So investors, traders really just excited by the fact that you have uh, the country's largest publicly traded mall REIT. Uh, the fact that they are reopening their properties at the time of the call. I believe it was 89 of a total of 178. And they plan to open all of those, David. So, Abigail, not a lot of transparency there. What about that big Taubman deal? Did they talk about that? Not really. That's another thing. Not a lot of information coming out of this call. But what could be the idea, I was speaking with Lindsay Dutch, one of our REIT analysts here at Bloomberg, and her sense is they will go through with it, maybe at a discount. So that could be a piece of the excitement. To the flip side or the downside, though, uh, I was just mentioning how they plan on delaying that dividend. It's interesting only because they're talking about delaying it to June. Not a lot of color that they have there, really waiting for more more information to see how much they will cut it. Uh, but given the stock is down so much this year, investors earlier had been happy. Now just about flat, David. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, Saudi Arabia this week cut its oil production, and President Trump just today tweeted out his praise for that, saying, among other things, that the oil companies in the United States are starting to look very good again. Welcome now. The Secretary of the Department of Energy is Dan Barrett. So thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. Uh, give us a sense of how it looks from your point of view. We were very concerned about the oil industry only a week or two ago. Is it looking better now? Well, first, thanks, David, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity today. And yes, it is starting to look really good. As the president tweeted out this morning, and as he's, he's been saying for quite some time now, uh, we're on the verge of a transition to greatness, and we're starting to see it. We now have 23 states that are opening opening up. Uh, there are local economies that represents roughly 40 percent of the gasoline demand in the United States. We're starting to see oil prices stabilize. I think it's very important to note that um, you know this increase is good for consumers in the sense that jobs are protected all across the economy. And uh, we've seen no dramatic impact on gasoline prices across the country, which I think is very important as well. So, Mr. Secretary, take us behind the scenes a little bit, if you can. Uh, we know that President Trump has a very good relationship with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. Was that cut at all something that the president helped uh, encourage or even arrange? The president has been personally engaged in this conversation for the last few weeks. Um, you know, as we talked about in the past, OPEC began its conversations around the March time frame, early March time frame, and Saudi Arabia and Russia got got themselves into a bit of a dispute over their production numbers. And um, when the Saudis decided to take some actions right at the beginning of this pandemic, that led to both increased production and a reduction in the pricing of oil across the world that impacted the U.S. producers uh, very dramatically. And the president saw that early. He engaged with the heads of state in both countries, both Russia. He's talked to President Putin several times. And he's also engaged personally with the king of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, the point of those conversations is to bring stability to the marketplace and stability to the producing community. And that's really our goal here. 
Is there any risk that actually the U.S. production may come back too far too fast? I mean, I, I just read there's Energy Transfer LP came out and said that at least in the Permian Basin, that actually shale's coming back quite fast. That went down about 8% and now a full quarter of that is back online. Are you at all concerned that that might undermine some of the efforts here to stabilize the oil price? No, I don't think so, David. I think what we're going to see here very shortly, if uh, if you're familiar with our Energy Information Administration, what we refer to as EIA, uh, they just put out a report about an hour or so ago that talks about the uh, economic boom that I think we're just on the verge of seeing. So the third and fourth quarters in 20 and certainly into 21 are going to be very, very robust. So the production will come back online as this economy begins to take off. And if you look at those numbers, I think you'll see the, the, that uh, that uh, what, what the president has referred to as a V-shaped recovery looks very clear in the charts right now. So you'll see the production tend to match that V-shaped curve. So, Mr. Secretary, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about what kinds of accommodations you needed to make. The president designated you along with Secretary Mnuchin to really help out the U.S. oil industry. And you were talking about certain things like lending facilities. We also have the Fed now doing that as well, changing their rules. Do we need that support anymore, or is that taken care of pretty much? Well, it's a little early to tell, and it, you know, it varies company by company, but what the Secretary directed uh, both Secretary Mnuchin and myself to do was to evaluate the programs that were passed by the Congress and ensure that there is access for these energy industries to those programs. And that's what we've done. Secretary Mnuchin uh, worked very closely with the Federal Reserve. Uh, we adjusted the program, the Main Street Lending Program, and uh, made that program available to what we refer to as mid-cap size com uh, companies. You know, there are companies in America that are investment grade. Um, they perhaps do not need the same level of economic help that others do in the marketplace, and they have access to capital and access to liquidity perhaps others don't have. But there are many companies out there that simply didn't have that option. So making available this program uh, that was passed by Congress was very, very important. And I, I applaud Secretary Mnuchin, the Federal Reserve, and others uh, for moving so aggressively to do exactly that. So, Mr. Secretary, when you implement a program like that, how do you deal with what a lot of people call moral hazard? As you said, the investor-grade companies don't really need it so much. Others do because they're not in nearly as good shape. But sometimes that's because they, let's be frank, borrowed too much. This tends to be a bit of a boom and bust business, as I understand it, in the oil patch. How do you make sure that we're not encouraging uh, almost reckless behavior when it comes to financing? That's absolutely correct, David. I mean, there's no question that moral hazard exists. It exists in every form of the banking industry. So, you know, when we apply these types of, um, you know, or we create these types of programs, we apply very strict lending standards to them. And what Secretary Mnuchin and I did was to ident identify those companies that really were impacted by COVID. I mean, it, but for the COVID pandemic, they would be strong, ongoing concerns. And we looked at those companies for potentially um, making loans available to them. We did, you know, we're very, very clear and very strict about this. There are some companies that were on the verge of insolvency, and they were highly leveraged and were perhaps not going to make it under any circumstance. Those companies are going to be excluded from these types of programs, and I think rightfully so. So uh, let's talk about another restriction that, as I understand, you put into place, and that is on imports of power grid equipment from adversaries. Uh, it's taken, and I'm not saying this, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it's taken by many to really refer to China. It raises the larger question about supply chains around the world that a lot of people are asking right now. What was the threat that you saw, the risk that you saw that required that restriction? Sure. The, um, so what happened, David, the, the president issued an executive order about a week or so ago now. What we've identified are certain threats within our bulk, what we refer to as the bulk power uh, uh, electric grid. It's the, 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 the pieces or the components that make up the electric grid that provide the enormous amounts of electricity that keep the lights on in our major cities. And what we have seen is that the supply chains have moved from the United States to other parts of the world, and in certain cases to parts of the world uh, that candidly don't have our interest at heart, and uh, they're adversarial countries. And what we began to see is the implement or the imposition of certain types of technology into some of these these uh, these components that make up the the grid that would allow data transfer. It would allow manipulation of the grid in certain cases, and that's very very concerning for us uh, because if you think about you know where we are today in this uh, pandemic. If someone who was, you know, not aligned with our goals in the United States, who, again, didn't have our interests at heart, 
decided to turn the lights off in New York City, then those hospitals go dark. And that's a very, very concerning situation for us. So the president rightfully recognized this. We have begun the process of evaluating the grid. We'll be working with the, the industry players, both at the governmental level as well as uh, the private industry level, uh, to identify these pieces of equipment, and we will inform them as to what we find. Are we confident that there are U.S. or other, I guess I would say, friendly sources that can replace that equipment? Or is some of this equipment we need to get from countries that, as you put it, don't necessarily have our interests at heart? Yeah, we do have the capabilities of doing that. As we saw with the pandemic, I mean, you know, so much of our supply chain has moved overseas, and we've lost the capability to make certain things. But in this case, I think it's very uh, it's very clear to us that we can manufacture many of these components here in the United States, and it's probably best that we do so. Okay. Uh, one last question I have to ask. We see a lot of people, including at the White House now, who are having to limit their activities because of COVID-19. How has it affected the Department of Energy? Do you have a lot of cases there? Are you having to quarantine people, people work from home? How does it affect the workings of your department? Sure. Well, we have moved to a um, you know, maximum telework environment. Many of our employees are working from home. Uh, you know, we have very, very few cases uh, here within the department. We have approximately 100,000 employees and federal contractors uh, to our department. And, you know, the numbers uh, that we have in terms of actual cases are less than 500 across the entire complex. So we've been blessed in that regard. I'm also happy to report, though, that uh, we have, you know, our, our mission here at the department is not only to focus on things like electricity, oil and gas, and the provision of energy, it's also to be the, the nation's steward of our national nuclear war weapon stockpile. Mm -hmm. And uh, we supply those warheads to the United States Navy, and I'm happy to report that we've not missed a single shipment. Nothing has been delayed, and our employees have performed just admirably throughout this entire pandemic. Mr. Secretary, I really appreciate your spending time with us again today. It's always good to hear from you. That is Secretary Dan Burrett of the Department of Energy. Coming up here, we're going to turn to a state that depends on energy a lot. That is Alaska. We'll talk with the governor. He is Mike Dunley. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. A strong warning today from America's top infectious disease expert about reopening the economy too soon. Testifying from his home, Dr. Anthony Fauci addressed members of the Senate Health Committee. There is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak you may not be able to control, which in fact, paradoxically will set you back, not only leading to some suffering and death that could be avoided, but could even set you back on the road to trying to get economic recovery, because it would almost turn the clock back rather than going forward. Dr. Fauci also said there are at least eight coronavirus vaccines in development. His call for caution puts him in conflict with President Trump's race to reopen the country for business and ease restrictions that have crushed the economy. House Democrats are wrapping up a draft of their virus relief bill. Majority Leader Steny Hoyer says he is hoping for a vote on Friday. Hoyer told reporters today the bill will include a long list of Democratic priorities, including aid to state and local governments, mortgage assistance, and funding for the U.S. Postal Service. President Trump says he's in no rush to provide more aid. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi says the government will spend the equivalent of nearly 10 percent of the country's GDP on a coronavirus economic relief package. In a televised speech today, Prime Minister Modi said the $265 billion plan will help India get back on its feet and compete globally. India is in its sixth week of a strict nationwide lockdown. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Alaska is dealing with the economic and health issues raised by this crisis that really all 50 states are dealing with. 
but it is particularly reliant upon energy and also on tourism, and so it may make it vulnerable in ways that other states are not. We welcome now the governor of the state of Alaska. He is Mike Dunleavy, a Republican. So welcome, Governor. It's great to have you with us. Give us a sense, first of all, of where the virus is in your state. How many cases are they growing? Are they diminishing? Where are you? So we're, we, have, uh, we have the lowest numbers in the country for, for states uh, up here in Alaska. We're still in a, a high 300s. Uh, we had a case, uh, you know, over the weekend we had a, a couple cases. There's been a couple days here in the past two weeks where we didn't have any cases. And so we've had very low cases. We've had 10 deaths total um, out of the 300 and, uh, uh, or close to 300 and getting close to 390 cases. We've had um, the vast majority have recovered. We have about 60 cases that have not recovered, uh, 30 hospitalizations, 10 deaths. So our numbers are actually really good. And in a way, it's those numbers that compel us to begin to reopen. And we, we reopened, we started to reopen about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And uh, we never really had the, um, the complete that a lot of states have. But nonetheless, we are working through uh, several phases. We'll be opening more up here next week, and that means restaurants will be going up to 50, uh, 50 per, or excuse me, 75 percent. Uh, bars will be able to have more folks uh, uh, in, in their uh, in their settings. The retail has already been open, so really, what we're working on are things like uh, where you would be shoulder to shoulder in in close congregate settings. Those are some of the areas that we're still having discussions with uh, folks on, but nonetheless, um, we uh, we've been very fortunate. We've never really closed the state down like other places have, and at the same time, we've quietly opened up much of the state, and uh, things seem to be working well so far. So that sounds like a very good report, Governor. Congratulations. I guess I want to know why do you think that happened? Did you do some things that other people didn't do? Did you get ahead of it earlier? Or is it simply the fact that uh, Alaskans tend to be more spread out than the rest of the country? Yeah, very good question. It's a combination of things, to be honest with you. So. We received that plan from Wuhan, China, on January 26th, uh, which had the U.S. State Department uh, 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 workers and their families that were getting out. We, we brought them into Anchorage. They were uh, screened in Anchorage and then sent on to California. So we knew early on that something was going on, and we stood up our, um, our disaster team, and we turned it into a pandemic team. Alaska has a lot of earthquakes, fires, floods, and so forth, so we have a... Uh, we have a system up here by which we deal with those disasters, but we had to modify it to deal with what could have been a pandemic. So we had stood this up. We were looking at things early on. The other thing that Alaska has going for it, obviously, is we're detached from much of the rest of the country. Uh, we are only bordered by Canada, the Yukon Territory, and British Columbia. There's only three uh, roads, uh, four roads in and out of Alaska, and three of those are very, very small uh, local roads. One's a little larger, but nonetheless, we were able to limit travel under the state, and we were able to limit air travel under the state as well. That helped tremendously. And so in the end, it's, it's our low numbers. We are spread out. We limited travel. But we really are, we're in the top ten in testing. Um, we, um, we, we, we have a great, uh, I have to be honest with you, we have, we have great uh, citizens who um, are, are, have, dealt with, uh, have dealt with disasters over the years. And so when you ask them, uh, to do something that will help the overall situation for everyone. Um, everyone in Alaska wants to help out. And so we had a lot of folks that did social distancing and, and, and did stay six feet apart from each other, et cetera. And so this is all combined to keep our cases down. Again, we're testing is in the top 10. We're testing more and more, and we're, we're tracking and tracing. And so we're doing the things we're supposed to do. Uh, Governor, give us a sense about your Native American population up there, because we certainly have heard in the lower 48 some real issues that they tend to have a higher incidence and a higher uh, infection rate. We had the President of the United States actually go to Arizona and meet with Native Americans to talk about that problem specifically. Do you have that problem in Alaska? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So we have the highest uh, Native population per capita in the country. Fifteen percent of our population is, is Native Alaskan. Uh, Eskimo, Aleute, uh, Indians. Uh, uh, and so we were watching what was happening in the lower 40 because, remember, Alaska suffered tremendously during the Spanish flu of 1918, and the vast majority of folks that died in Alaska were Native Alaskans. And so there is a history and a memory. And we have about 200 communities that are isolated and off a road system. Some of our communities are upwards of 1,000 miles away from any road that leads to anywhere. And most of these are native, uh, native communities. And so 
We've worked very closely with them. And in, mel- in most cases, those communities, we uh, work with them so that they can limit travel into their communities. And as a result, um, again, we've only had uh, 10 deaths, 300 and some cases, 390 some, 390 cases roughly, and um, uh, only two cases, um, three, uh, three cases in rural Alaska. So we've been able to contain this spread and keep it out of uh, the vast majority of rural Alaska, including our native villages. And um, we are very, very, uh, very conscious of making sure that our folks, our native Alaskans, uh, don't suffer the way uh, folks did back in 1918. So it's working out pretty well as we speak right now. Okay. Really appreciate your being with us, Governor Mike Dunleavy. And I'm delighted to say he will be remaining with us in the second hour of Balance of Power. We're going to talk to him about how the energy industry is affected by those low oil prices up in Alaska. In the meantime, here we are going to actually talk about the Supreme Court arguments that were held today. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Supreme Court is holding some potentially historic arguments today in a couple of cases involving President Trump's tax records, one with a request coming from the Congress, the other from a grand jury here in New York City. We welcome now Greg Farrell. He is our legal and investigative reporter. So, Greg, I got to hear about an hour of the arguments. I had to come do this program in the meantime. It's fascinating, but they are two quite different cases in some senses, right? Yes, exactly. They've been lumped together. Uh, the House uh, you know, Committee on Financial Services wants access to Trump's uh, tax records, or one of the House committees does, controlled by Democrats. And in the case of the second case, it's uh, New York District Attorney Cyrus Vance uh, is doing a follow-up investigation on the Michael Cohen guilty plea, on the information that came out as part of that federal case several years ago. Um, in both cases, the president is fighting against the disclosure of his personal tax returns. Uh, so some of the questions that have come from the justices in the first case uh, are focused on whether or not you know, a precedent would be bad to have basically a competing party in the House of Representatives able to harass a sitting president uh, without a stated legislative goal. Um, and now the argument that's going now, uh, going on now concerning the criminal inquiry, the grand jury uh, process in Manhattan, involves basically some of the disclosures that were made with Michael Cohen's guilty plea, namely that the Trump organization, before Donald Trump became president, um, and then afterwards, uh, basically manipulated its books and records to pay off Cohen for the money he had advanced to uh, at least one of the women uh, who had promised to go public with her personal story, allegations about uh, mm-hmm. Trump um, during the right. campaign. So uh, it will be interesting to see if the Supreme Court comes down as a, as a unit mm-hmm. on both of them. Uh, I suspect there will be a slightly different ruling mm-hmm. or arguments to each one. Yeah. Yeah, and it's always impossible, uh, having had experience doing this, it's impossible to figure out what the justices are really thinking from their questions. But I thought that they did focus on a couple of things that are different from what we've seen before. First of all, this is not a presidential executive privilege case. case. This is not something that happened while he was in office. These records are have, pertain to what he did before he came to office. And also, they, he doesn't have to turn them over. They're in a third party's possession, so he doesn't have to go to any trouble. It's his, his accountant, people like that, that can turn it over. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, and also, uh, the, and part of the president's defense is that, uh, in essence, I think Jay Sekulow said something along the lines of, not that he's above the law, but a, a better way of phrasing that, that he should not be you know, treated as an ordinary citizen. That's, uh, that will be tough for justices to sign off on a statement like that or to basically affirm in that. Um, uh, so, yes, this is not the, the, the whole argument that the president has used in other areas, like with special counsel Robert Mueller, that certain communications are have protected by executive privilege would not apply here. Yeah. And as you suggest, Greg, the, actually the president's position really puts the court in a tough position because it's such an almost absolute claim. There's not much give. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is fascinating. Again, on both sides, there'll be a lot to uh, tease out. It'll have a real impact if this is a decision to right. disclose, because that will obviously then come in the summer and fall of an election campaign. So um, this is just a, uh, a huge day of arguments at the Supreme Court. 
It sure is. It's fascinating for those of us who like to follow that. Thank you so much to Greg Farrell for that coverage. In the meantime, we have some breaking news right now. The Democrats have released their bill for some further relief that includes money for elections and USPA, that is USPS, that is the Postal Service, also has $75 billion for testing and tracing. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, is due to speak at 3 o'clock this afternoon. That's Eastern time. That does it for the first hour of Balance of Power, but there will be a second hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio where we'll be resuming our discussion with the Alaskan governor. He is Mike Dunleavy. That does it for Balance of Power for, on television. I'm David Weston.